one of the things that oh, has, has tossed me back and forth a little bit over the years, and I believe probably most of us dragged us one way and then the other way, is the question, is it, is it hard or is it easy to be safe? Is it hard or is it easy to be safe? I know that for the, the first part of my Christian life, the first maybe 75%, even though I knew that I would be saved, I felt it was difficult. I felt it was very hard. I knew I would make it because I felt like I was I was a fighter and because I knew I loved the Lord and I knew that no matter how, how hard it was, I was going to make it. And besides, I knew that the Lord loved me also, but I felt that it was hard. Then somewhere along the line, I came to understand certain other things and I, I began to think it's not that hard. But from time to time, I've come upon uh, I've come upon questions, even verses in the Bible that seem to suggest that it is a hard thing. Being saved is difficult. It's hard, and um, so I, I had a recent discussion where that that was brought up also. And it, it rested on my mind a little bit. So this week, I went back to the Bible to look at some of these verses. And I would like to share with you today some of the conclusions I've come to. Because I suspect, even if we don't have that, even if we don't have those questions, but I suspect we will meet upon people who have these difficulties. And it, it is good if we are able to help them to understand better how to resolve some of these issues. Now. Of course, as always, I, I would like to use uh, my PowerPoint and my Bible to to direct us in our study this morning. So let me go ahead and um, bring up that PowerPoint. Okay, here we go. All right. Now, probably one of the most definitive statements that we can come across that we could use is this one found in um, in Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 10. I know this is, is probably our go-to verse. Look at what it says. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. So, probably, this is, the, ver this is the, the verse that we would come to most of the time when we talk about how can we be saved. And it seems to be very clear. There, there doesn't seem to be any room here for any doubt or any kind of um, misunderstanding. It says we are saved by, by grace through faith. And if you look at this statement, it talks about two sides to salvation the first side is that it is by grace and we would say that that is god's part and the second part says it is through faith and that is our involvement but it goes on to say not of yourselves and that suggests that we ourselves do not play a part in our salvation it's, it's by grace highlight are not working well Uh, okay, I'll leave it alone. You're not seeing it. It's, op no, no, not it. it's opaque. It's not transparent. I will tell you something, man. I'm going to have to switch to Zoom or something. All right, let me let me um not use the highlighter. Let me do something else. All right, so by grace. Is that better? Yep. 
You can see that, okay? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. All right. By grace, through faith. All right. And it, it goes on to say, it is the gift of God. I think I'm going to come back to this verse in the process of our discussion because for me, this verse is definitive. It's, it's one of the most comprehensive verses that tells you exactly what is involved in the process of saving us. Two sides. One side is God's side. One side is, my, is our, our side. And our side is really not, not a work. It's not something that, that involves working because it says, not of works lest any man should boast. Whatever our involvement is, it leaves no place for anybody to, to, get, to take any credit or to boast. Nobody can say, I have done this. I have, I've contributed to my salvation. It is by grace. And if we go to chapter one of the same book, same Ephesians, we see where Paul says, God ordained that it should be by grace so that all the glory and the praise will go to God. So that's the verse I want to begin with in looking at this subject. Is it difficult or is it easy to be saved? All right. Now, I'd like to look at a few verses. I found about five of them that seem to suggest that salvation is difficult. It's hard. You know, which, which, which verses do we use? Sometimes it really depends on who you, you talk to. I know that you have many people who are maybe members of, the, of a certain church, of a, different, of, of a certain denomination, who will, who will often find the verses that say that salvation is hard. But the verses are there to be found, and that's why they find them. And there are the people who will often emphasize that, you know, that the Christian journey is a journey of hard labor. But the verses are there, and I want us to look at them. Number one, Matthew 7, verses 13 to 14. I'm going to put up about five of them. I don't know. There may be more, but five of them were the ones that I could bring to mind fairly readily. Jesus himself speaking says, Enter ye in at the straight gate. And of course, we understand the word straight means narrow. Something that is so narrow that it is tight. You have, you have heard the phrase, a straight jacket. You know that a straight jacket is, um, a, a straight jacket is a coat that they put on mentally mentally challenged people and it 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 it's straight because it it locks them in it 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 closes on them so tightly that they can't move so straight means something that is so tight it's difficult to get through jesus says wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and many there be which go in thereat because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it so this verse this passage definitely makes it look like it's a hard thing to be saved only a few people find that way we go on to the next verse that i want to look at philippians 2 and verse 12 it says Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Wow, this is a difficult one. Because it's like Paul is saying that when we are, when we are on the road of salvation, we must, we must be afraid and we must tremble. And we are to work it out. We are to work it out. And in the process of working it out, we are to be fearful to the point of trembling. I have to admit, this is not how I have come to view the process of being saved. This is not how I have come to view it. So this is another challenging verse. And I'm going to read these verses first, and then afterwards I'm going to try to look at the bible and see if we can come to some 
understanding that harmonizes the different the different ideas that we see in the new testament so the next verse this one may be not not as difficult but it may be matthew 19 verse 24 says and again i say unto you it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of god so you know i've heard theologians say that this eye of a needle it doesn't really mean a sewing needle they say that there was a gate outside jerusalem that was called a needle's eye and that it was it was always a little difficult to get it, get the camels to go through that gate because they had to crouch down and go through but i i think every day camels travel through that gate and furthermore when Jesus made this statement, do we remember what the disciples said? When Jesus made the statement, the disciples says, who then can be saved? The, 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 the example that Jesus put before them looked impossible. So I don't believe it was talking about that gate at Jerusalem. I think it was talking about a literal needle's eye. Because when the disciples heard it they thought it's impossible for somebody to be saved using this standard so to me it is obvious i've even found one bible translation which says the eye of a sewing needle so this again would make us agree with the disciples who then can be saved if a camel can go through, but then Jesus said, look at what Jesus said afterwards. He says, with men, this is impossible. So that again, you know, maybe we should even just look at the, the verse. Matthew 19 and verse 24. Let me bring it up quickly and we just see it because I wanted to see that um, what Jesus says next. Verse 24. It is easier for a camel to go to the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, Look at what Jesus says. With men, this is impossible. So I absolutely do not believe he was talking about that gate outside Jerusalem. He's talking about something which is not possible. Men cannot do it. But with God, all things are possible. So, but again, again, when you look at this, it suggests to you, it suggests to us that being saved, entering the kingdom of God is, is very, very difficult. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to experience it. Here's a verse in 1 Peter 4 and verse 18. It says, if, if the righteous scarcely be saved wow that one is a little difficult isn't it if the righteous scarcely be saved where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear now this one is very difficult because we think that an abundant place has been prepared for us. An abundant salvation has been provided. A completely adequate salvation. And that this salvation provided for us can save us far away and beyond our little bit of salvation that we need. And yet Peter here says that the righteous scarcely be saved. And he goes on to emphasize his point by saying, we shall the ungodly. And the sinner appear if the righteous scarcely be saved all right and the last one i think i have on the list is this one in acts 14 and verse 22 where it says that paul went through confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of god Again, um, it's almost like some of the disciples said to Jesus, this is an hard saying. Who can bear it? 
I might have that on my list, so let me see. Anyway, but the point is that it says that in order to enter the kingdom of God, it must be through the process of much tribulation. That doesn't sound like something easy at all. The verses we have looked at so far, all of them seem to suggest that being saved is hard. It's very difficult. It's very testing. And it takes exceptional people because the way is very hard. And only a few people are going to find this pathway. Anyway, let's go on and not jump to any conclusions. But I admit that these verses present a challenge. Now, on the other hand, I want to show us that there are verses that say salvation is easy. Before we try to resolve all of this, I want to show us both sides of the coin. Look at what it says in Romans 10 and verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, all right, that's easy enough. All of us have a mouth. Unless we are dumb, we can do this. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart. All right, we might say that that is still a, a little harder. But it still is not too impossible. If, we if thou shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. What is this about the righteous being scarcely saved? What is this about through much tribulation? What is this about it is harder for, for it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle? This appears to be so blessedly simple. If you confess, if you open your mouth and make the statement, and if you believe in your heart, this is salvation. This is what it means to be saved. And um I think we have an example in the Bible of the, the thief on the cross. He believed in his heart and he confessed with his mouth. And Jesus says, I'm telling you today that you will be with me in paradise. In John 6 verses 28 and 29. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is... The work of God. This is the work of God. That you believe. On him whom he had sent. The work of God. The work of God. What do we mean by the work of God? I would suggest that this is what God requires of you. This is what God requires of you. The work of God. What they wanted to do. Was to do what God wanted. What shall we do that we might work the works of God? They considered the things that God could accomplish as being great things that they wanted to do. But Jesus says that the thing that God is doing and that God wants you to be involved in is this work that you believe on Jesus Christ. That's the work of God. And, you know, he would suggest that once you do this, you have fulfilled your commitment. There's nothing else that God wants of you. So we have all of these And of course, we have John 3, 16. It says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him. We're all familiar with that verse. I won't even dwell on that at all. Let's move on. We not only have been told that, we, we not only are given these verses that suggest that it is easy. We are given verses that tell us we should have the assurance, the confidence and I could start with a verse in Isaiah. I know this is an Old Testament verse, but it establishes the principle. And I want us to remember the principle. In Isaiah 30, verse 15, look at what it says. For thus said the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest shall you be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength and you would not all right god is is critical of the the hebrews because they would not they would not accept and and practice the things that would bring them victory and success god says this is the way to be saved and of course he wasn't talking about eternal salvation he was talking about being saved from their enemies. But the principle is the same. 
God says, in returning, in coming back to me and in resting, you will be saved. And how will you be strong? You will be strong by being quiet and confident. So God is emphasizing the principle of being saved when you are drowning. You have heard the example many times. When a person is drowning and somebody comes to save you, the best thing you can do is relax and act as though you are dead. Don't raise a finger to try to help. The only thing you can do is you, if the person says, hold my hand, you can hold on to the hand. Don't try to do anything because if you try, you will hamper the one who is saving you. This principle is the principle in how we, we relate to God, whether in physical things or in spiritual things, whether in temporal salvation or eternal salvation, the principle is the same. God says in coming back to me, in returning and in resting, learning to stop fighting and giving yourself into the hand of God, this is how you will be saved. And you will be strong if you have quietness and confidence. In other words, your attention is to be focused on God, not on yourself. If you focus your attention on, on God, on yourself, you will be weak. If you focus on God in, in being quiet, keep yourself still and trust in God, then you will be strong. And God bemoans the fact that you would not, they would not. Another verse that speaks of assurance. Jesus says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. And we have to ask the question, in what are we, are they laboring? And what is this heavy, heavy, being heavy laden? And I will give you rest. All right. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, we could argue that Jesus is here speaking about the load of sin. But I'm suggesting that he's not talking about the load of sin. He's talking about the weight of trying to do in order to please God. Because notice, they're laboring. It's not just that they're carrying a load of sin. We could say heavy laden means you're carrying the load of sin. But it's not, it's, that's not the load he's talking about. He's talking about people who are working. What he promises is rest. I'm going, to, I'm going to take from you this burden of working. And he says, take my yoke because my yoke is easy. And what is a yoke? If we consider a yoke. It becomes more clear. A yoke is when you bind yourself to somebody else. It's an instrument that binds two cattle together. That where one goes, the other has to follow. So Jesus says, the answer to your, your labor and your hard work is to bind yourself to me. Connect yourself to me in a way that you cannot be separated. And you will find that everything becomes easy. Everything becomes light. You are laboring and you are, you are working hard and you have no rest. Like the proverb says, it's not the load that gets you down. It's the fact that you bear it all alone. It's not the load that gets you down. It's the fact that you bear it all alone. You know, I'm lifting this, this heavy chest or this heavy bench. My four-year-old grandson comes along and he, say, and he, he takes hold of one side. Okay. Because he's my grandson and because he wants to help, I let him take hold of one side. And do you know what? He's more of a hindrance than a help. He's holding me back. But, you know, I let him hold it. And how much, how much load do you think he's lifting? He's lifting nothing. He's only holding on. I'm doing all the lifting. But because I'm holding on, I'm directing him which way to go. He's coming along with me. His yoke, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. What, he, what I'm giving him is the privilege of being involved in it with me when he's doing nothing and I'm doing everything. This is what Jesus is saying. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. 
you will find rest to your souls. You have rest because you know that somebody has the burden who knows how to deal with the burden and, and you are connected to this burden. So there's nothing to worry about. You can rest while the burden is being carried because you are connected to the person. The person is the key. Here's another verse in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 7. And I'm, I think I will come back to this verse a little later on and you will see why. It says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. God has not made us afraid. God has not made us fearful. If we are afraid, that spirit does not come from God. But he has given us the spirit of power, the spirit of love, and the spirit of a sound mind, a balanced mind that can look at things and, and understand and, and have an awareness of God and know our, our security in him. Look at this one in Hebrews 7 verse 25. Wherefore he is able also to do what? To save them to the uttermost. Notice, he is able. He's able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing the reason he lives, one of the reasons for his existence, he, he lives forever to make intercession for them. So if somebody like this is, is living for my sake, why would I ever be afraid? Why would I ever be concerned that, that I, might, I might lose my way or that I might, I might slip and fall? Because he is able to save to the utmost. The only way I would be afraid is, is if I have taken myself out of his hand. That's the only reason why I should ever be afraid. Same thing, Philippians 1 and verse 6. Being confident of this very thing. Look at the word again. Being confident. Confident means that you have a certainty. You are full of optimism. You are full of hope and expectation. Being confident of this thing. That he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it. Who will perform it? He will perform it. You won't perform it. He began the work and he will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He will perform it until Jesus comes again. We have a lot of reason to have hope and confidence, brothers and sisters. I mean, these verses, they are, they are so solid and strong and, and undisputable. And yet, I am admitting that the other verses are there. The ones we started with, the five that I read at the beginning. I'm not going to leave it hanging. I'm going back to those verses. So here are the points that we made. These are the difficult verses. The gate is straight and narrow. Only a few people find it. Number two, we are to work out our, out our salvation and we are to do it with fear and trembling. Number three, it is very hard for a rich man to be saved. So hard that you might question who then can be saved. Number four, the righteous will scarcely be saved seems to suggest that even for the righteous person you're barely going to squeeze in much more the ungodly point number five we must enter through much tribulation as though if we don't suffer we're not going to make it so these five points and what i'm going to do is spend the rest of the time looking at these five points and seeing if we can discover exactly what are they saying and how can we how can these five points be made to to harmonize with the other truths that we see in the word of god because one of the things we can be certain of is that when we see contradiction in the bible i mean sometimes you might have a word that may be inappropriate but when 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 you have passages and ideas that seem to conflict, 
then you know the, 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 the problem is that you are lacking in understanding in some areas. What you need is greater understanding because the word of God does not contradict. We might fail of understanding, and that is the problem. And so if we can harmonize these verses, they should make perfect sense. So let us look at point number one, the straight and narrow gate. Now, I've, 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 I know I have touched on this already, and some of us might remember, because I had a problem because I was thinking of my dead brother and my dead father. At one point in my life, after they died, I was thinking of the fact that they were not perfect. Now, now mind you, neither am I perfect. Okay, neither am I perfect. I'm not perfect in my behavior. I don't know if anybody in this room will say I am perfect in my behavior, but I certainly can't say that. But you know the way, you know the way Phariseeism is? And you know the way legalism is, you always think the other person is, 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 a, is a little worse than you. I am bad, but he's worse. And I have to admit that in the back of my mind, I was thinking this way about my, my father and my brother. I could think about their faults and I could excuse mine. <laughs> I could say I pray more. I could say I spend more time with the Bible. I could say my faults are not as obvious but I was not perfect, and they were not perfect. And I found that when they both died, I found myself with a question in my mind. Will I see Daddy and Tony? Will I see them again? It, it, was a, it, was, it was out of this experience that I came to understand that I had a misguided understanding no, I didn't have a misguided understanding. I, my, my mind was not free from the shackles of legalism. That's what I realized. I was still not, not fully grasping the concept of salvation by grace through faith, being saved by grace through faith. I was not grasping the concept because I was questioning my brother and my father's salvation on the basis of their behavior. I was measuring them by my concept of their behavior. So there is this terrible verse. Try to enter the straight gate. Because broad is the way and winding is the way that leads to destruction. And many people walk that way. But narrow is the gate and straight that leads to eternal life. And few people find this gate. You know, the, 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 the verses were in the Bible staring me in the face and I never saw them until I came to this difficult point in my life. And then I could see the verses. Look at this verse. You see the straight gate. How come you didn't see this? Jesus says, I am the door. What's another name for door? You could say the gate. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. He shall be saved. If we enter in through this gate, we shall be saved. And he shall go in and out and find pasture. So that began to open my eyes. Okay, Jesus is the door. He says it again in this verse. In John 14 and verse 6, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I'm going to read one more verse. And when I read this verse, everything will just jump into, into, into perfect clarity. Acts 4 verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven. What does that mean? That means from the South Pole to the North Pole. It means from East to West. It means from North to South. It means from the, the great continents to the tiniest island. You will never find another name 
under heaven under the vastness of the, the the heavens the universe you will not find another name whereby we must be saved there's no other way does that sound like it's narrow does that sound like it is straight absolutely when something is not narrow you have one or two 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 entrances <laughs> you have some homes you have some homes well like 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 you have some animals who live in burrows they dig a hole in the ground and those who are smart they dig a back door those who are not smart they just have a, one little entrance and they make it small that they can squeeze through but sometimes an animal a carnivore a hunter gets in through that front door small enough he can get through like a weasel gets into a rabbit's burrow or something and if there's no back door, that's goodbye for them. The, the, the predator will get them. But if they're smart, they have a back door. But in the case of the kingdom, Jesus is saying there is not there are not several doors. There's only one door. This is narrow and it is so tight that you have to squeeze your way in. And the tight door is Jesus. There is no other name on the heaven. So when Jesus says, straight is the gate and narrow that leads to eternal life what he's saying is that he's not saying it is hard to get in it's not saying it is, he's not saying that the, the, the way to be saved is a way where you have to be constantly constricted this is how i understood it i understood look here when you get on this narrow path you can't eat pork you can't eat eat flesh meats you, you, you can't wear this kind of garment. You can't put on any, any, any jewelry, any decoration. You can't speak an odd word on the Sabbath. It was so narrow. It was so tight. It was so straight that it was difficult. It was, it was, it was in sometimes a burden. This narrow pathway, it was sometimes a burden. It was, it was you get up in the morning and you try to remember all the things you must do and all the things you mustn't do and it was a heavy burden and a worrisome yoke i never understood that the straight gate had to do with how do you get on the pathway the gate is narrow and constricted because there's only one single way to get in and it is jesus all right i can manage that you know what my father wasn't perfect and my brother wasn't perfect. They got through the door. Both of them were Christians. Both of them gave their lives to Christ. They were not perfect and I am not perfect, but all of us belong to Jesus Christ. We got through the door. And that's what Jesus meant. You can't get in by Buddha or Muhammad or Hare Krishna or any of that nonsense. There's only one way. And that is why few people find a way because everybody is looking for some way other than jesus it's beautiful it's beautifully simple and everything is in perfect harmony when you understand it the second verse we looked at says that we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling the problem is this phrase fear do you know do you know it says that um god has not given us a spirit of fear we read that verse god has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind why does paul also say we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling when he says god has not given us a spirit of fear what does this phrase suggest to you fear and trembling it suppose it's it suggests that you are to come with a a great deal of uneasiness a great deal of concern because you might lose your way as you are working out your salvation you are supposed to be constantly trembling and constantly afraid that you might lose the pathway this does not sound like assurance to me this sounds like somebody who is uncertain why does paul use this phrase fair and trembling well look at this look at this Ephesians 6 and verse 5. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh. With what? With fear and trembling. 
in singleness of your heart as unto Christ. Paul says two things here. He says that when you're working for somebody, well, of course, in this case, these servants were bond slaves. They were slaves, all right? But Paul says you are to be afraid of your master and you are to tremble. But he says, as unto Christ. He seems to, to be suggesting that when we come to Jesus also, we must, be, we must have this fear and we must be trembling. Is it reasonable to believe that as we come to our brother and our friend and our savior, we are supposed to, be, to, to have fearfulness and to the point of trembling when Jesus says, I will give you rest and my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Is it reasonable to think that this is how we should come to Christ? Is it reasonable to believe that when you come before your master, you are to be like a dog that is uncertain, who is trembling and afraid? Is Paul saying this, this is how we should do it? Let's look at one other place where this phrase is used. 2 Corinthians 7, verses 13 to 15. Paul says, therefore, we, are, we were comforted in your comfort, yea, and exceedingly the more joyed for the joy of Titus, because his spirit was refreshed by you all. Now look at what it says. And his inward affection is more abundant toward you Whilst he remembered the obedience of you all, how with fear and trembling you received him. You must begin to understand by now that there's something about this phrase that doesn't mean exactly what it says when you look at the words. Paul says when Titus went to look for these brethren in Corinth, the people in Corinth were obedient to Titus. And they received Titus with fear and trembling. If you take the words literally, what it suggests is that the people in Corinth were scared to death of Titus. When they saw him, they were filled with fear to the point where they started to tremble. Is that how Paul expected them to behave in the presence of a messenger from the Lord? To be afraid of him and to be trembling? Is that what it means? When you put all the passages together, what, what conclusion I come to? I come to the conclusion that this phrase, look at the phrase. This phrase, fear and trembling, I'm going to suggest to you it simply means with respect and earnestness. Respect and earnestness. It is, it is like what we would refer to as an idiomatic expression. Now, let me explain what that means. You know, some time ago, when I had, I had a disagreement with a certain brother in the movement, one of the leaders in the movement, and he started to, um, he started to say a, a, a number of things and write things and preach in opposition to what I was sharing when I got into the message of righteousness by faith. And so one, I wrote something where I said that this brother came against me with a vengeance. He came with a vengeance. Sometimes afterwards I met him and he, he said, um, what do you mean by saying I came with a vengeance? I had no, I had no thoughts of revenge towards you. I was not doing anything from vengeance or revenge. Now, most of us will understand what I mean when I say he did it with a vengeance. But he didn't understand. And if any of you don't understand, let me explain what it is. It's a phrase. It's, like, it's, it's what we call an idiomatic expression. It means when you do something with a lot of intensity. So you say somebody does it with a vengeance. You know, he was digging a hole. But the sun was hot, so he was going slowly. But then it started to rain and he went back to work with a vengeance. It means now that he starts working with a lot of vigor and intensity. It has nothing to do with revenge or vengeance. It's a phrase that is used and it means this. It's like, it's like we say it's raining cats and dogs. It has nothing to do with cats and it has nothing to do with dogs. I mean, somewhere in the past, it might have somehow, but... 
today if you say it's raining cats and dogs every sense of the person knows that you mean it's raining very hard so it's an idiom idiomatic expression that's what that's what we mean when we use these kinds of phrases it's like in the bible when it says 40 days and 40 nights they never say 40 days they say 40 days and 40 nights they add the nights because that's the way they say things like in jamaica we say on your left hand side or your right hand side we don't say on your left hand or on your left or on your right we say on your left hand side or on your right hand side well let's put on the hand side so it's clear to me that this phrase with fear and trembling is is one of those expressions it doesn't mean you are to be afraid and it doesn't mean you must tremble it means that you are to approach it with sobriety and with intensity so when it says that you are to be uh, obedient to your masters with fear and trembling it means you are to take it seriously you are to approach it with 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 commitment and discipline and when it says they received titus with fear and trembling it means they took him seriously they gave him they gave him appropriate attention reverence as well again is suggesting yes so when it says we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling it has nothing to do with being afraid it has nothing to do with trembling it simply means we are to approach it with sobriety and with intense intense concern because that is how we are to relate to christianity not as something trivial and light so this is this is what i believe this phrase means as it is used in the bible three places fear and trembling fear and trembling and um when you look at the three verses then it begins to make sense as i said probably an idiomatic expression the third one it's hard for a rich man to be saved it's easy for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to be saved now i wanted to notice something when Jesus talked about the rich man being saved, notice what he talks about. He talks about the, the rich man getting through the gate. He doesn't talk about what happens when the rich man is inside. He talks about getting through the gate. That's what is the difficulty for the rich man. Why is this so? It's because there's another element to salvation that we didn't, we didn't highlight. And I'll show you. Jesus says in Luke 14, verses 26 to 28. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost whether he have sufficient to finish it? Now in this phrase, count at the cost, brothers and sisters, we come upon the problem of the rich man. The problem of the rich man is that he counts the cost. And the cost is too much for him. The problem with the rich man is not living a Christian life. The problem with the rich man is not producing a holy life. The problem with the rich man is simply making up his mind when he thinks of what it will cost him to become a Christian. To no longer be tied to his riches, to no longer be dependent on his riches, to no longer maintain his status as a growing influence and power in his community because of his riches he cannot go through the door now we might say and we might we would say correctly that this rich man doesn't really believe and i, I accept that when you really believe what will happen is that you will really surrender you will really take up the cross the rich man does not take up his cross because he does not believe but the obstruction in his way is his riches his status and his riches become an obstruction in his way that prevents him from believing that stops him from paying the price his problem is entering the door in fact the path of salvation is not hard it is the entering that is hard 
The plot is not hard. Entering is hard. In order to enter, you have to make up your mind. Once you have made up your mind and you are through the door, Jesus says, "My, you have taken his yoke. He says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Once you have taken his yoke, the path is not hard. The path is filled with hardship and the path is filled with difficulty, but it is not hard because it is God who works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. It is not hard because it is Christ who is accomplishing his work in you. That's why it's not hard. As hard as the road is, as tough as the road is, as difficult as the road is, for you it is not hard because it is somebody else who is doing this work in you and for you. The hard part, I put it to you, brothers and sisters, is going through that narrow, narrow gate. Once you are through, you are in. And I know that it is possible for you to lose your way, but I'm telling you it's difficult. No, not to lose your way, to give up your way. It's possible to go back like a dog going back to its vomit and like a pig going back to wallowing in the mire, but it's very difficult. That is one of the hardest things to do in the Christian life. It's to go back to the old life. The third or the fourth verse that we looked at, it says, the righteous would barely be scared, would scarcely be saved. And I'll actually bring that up on the screen to remind us of what it says. It's um, First Peter 4, I think, and verse 18, is it? Yeah. It says, and if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? I think I will surprise you with the answer to this one. <laughs> I think I will surprise you. But um, let's go ahead. Will the righteous scarcely be saved? You see, you look at the you look at the statement, and it depends on how you see it. The righteous, the word scarcely seems to suggest that it's a very difficult thing for the righteous to be saved. Even though you're righteous, you can just barely, you can just barely, almost by by the skin of your teeth, make it into the kingdom, make it into into being saved. It seems that way. Let's see if that's what it's saying. I'm going to suggest to you that when it says the righteous scarcely be saved, this is speaking about the effort of Christ. Not the effort of you, the believer. The righteous scarcely be saved. Now, now look at the statement on the screen. If you say it is because of the effort of man, what do we mean by this? It means that the righteous will scarcely be saved because they are trying hard to be saved. They are working to be saved. And they just barely are able to squeeze through because their efforts are barely enough to get them in. Now, this is a contradiction to everything we know about salvation. Salvation is not because of the effort of man. Salvation is not because of the work of man. It's not the effort of man. It's by grace you are saved through faith, not by works. Not by works. So when it says the righteous scarcely be saved, it cannot be talking about the work of men. Because if it is a, if it is a work of man, if, it's, if it is a work of any of us, none of us will be saved. Not only will we, will we not be saved, we will not be scarcely saved or completely saved or abundantly saved. No saved at all. As long as our effort is, in, is, is, is a criterion, there is no saved at all for us. So on what basis can we say salvation is scarcely? The man can scarcely be saved. It must be on the basis of the effort of Christ. All right? Can we say that Jesus saves us and it is scarcely that we are saved we are just barely saved let us see if that makes sense look at hebrews 5 and verse 8 it says who in the days of his flesh when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears why is he crying unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. When Jesus was accomplishing our salvation, 
He was brought to the place of weeping. The experience he went through was so terrible that if you look at the next verse, you can see that it was our salvation, as it were, was almost in jeopardy. In Matthew 26, verse 39, he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Jesus wanted to be rid of the burden of the, of the terrible experience it took to save humanity. Our being saved scarcely, it was scarcely accomplished because Jesus came to the place where, you know, as one writer puts it, and I'm going to agree that our salvation, the cup of salvation trembled in, trembled in his hand. He was at the point almost of saying, please take this cup from me and bring me back to where I was with you before the foundation of the world. He came to that place where he was sweating great drops of tears. He went out of sweat, of blood, great drops of blood. He was going through a terrible experience. The righteous are saved by this experience, but they, they, are, they are scarcely saved because it's the one single way that we can be saved. Where then can the ungodly be saved? Where can the ungodly find any room to be saved? We the righteous are scarcely saved. It took the blood of the Son of God. It took the sacrifice of eternity to save us. Scarcely saved, even though our salvation is complete. But what Jesus had to go through for it, it was almost in jeopardy. How then can the ungodly be saved? I think this is what he's saying. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. So what I'm saying, this is the point of what I'm saying. When he talks about the difficulty in salvation, it is always referring to what God did through Christ. Because Jesus and God are the ones who experience the difficulty. It never refers to the effort of man. The only problem men have in salvation is going through the door, going through the gate. That's the only problem. Because the gate is straight and the gate is narrow. And because it, a man must make his decision to take the yoke of Christ. That's the hard part. When you are in, you are in the hands of Christ. I want to suggest this to you. When you come upon places in the Bible where it seems like it's difficult, salvation is difficult, what we have to understand is that we are looking at what God did. We are looking at God's part. For God, the difficulty was for God and his son. You and I are the, are the recipients of grace. By grace are you saved through faith. Not of works, lest any man should boast. It is the gift of God. This is where we are concerned. This is our part of the transaction. Through much tribulation, we must enter the kingdom. That's, I think that's the fifth verse that we looked at. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12 says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Jesus said, if the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Now, when Jesus says, when Paul says, I'm sorry, that we must enter into the kingdom through much tribulation. Let me go back to that. Um, everything hangs on this word through. When he says we must go through much tribulation, you know what we can look at at this as? We can say the process of being saved is the process of experiencing tribulation. Okay? In other words, how are we saved? We are saved by tribulation. Through tribulation. Your mind almost automatically takes that idea that in order to be saved tribulation saves you 
And that again is false teaching because nobody is saved by tribulation. We are saved by grace. Grace alone, through faith alone, not through tribulation. So what does Paul say? Through much tribulation, we shall enter the kingdom. And that's what I'm trying to say. If you look at the verses, all he's talking about is the consequences, not the way. The consequences, if you will live godly in Christ Jesus, what will happen? You will suffer persecution. Persecution is not a part of the process. Persecution is not a part of the process of salvation. It's not a part of the work of, that God is doing for you. It's, it's a consequence. It's like if you are born, you will start to grow. It's a consequence of going through this experience. Because you live godly, you suffer persecution. Persecution is not the saving element. No. So that's, Paul is not saying that through the, the hard work of persecution, through the hard experience of tribulation, this is the way that we can get into the kingdom. No. If this were so, there, were, there, there would be millions of godly little old men and old women who will never make it into the kingdom because they never went through much tribulation. So he's simply saying that if you will serve the Lord, what is going to happen is that the world is going to hate you and you are going to su suffer persecution. It's a condition that accompanies salvation. It's not a requirement then for salvation. It's not required. You don't have tribulation. It won't stop you from being saved. But most of the time, if you are, if you are saved, you are going to suffer tribulation. So the Bible explains to us that the work that man has to do is blessedly simple. First of all, he needs to believe. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. When the Jews asked Jesus, what shall we do that we might, we might work the works of God? Jesus says, this is the work of God that you believe on him whom he had sent. We looked at this passage, these passages before. Second thing is surrender. Now I have, I have, I have put surrender as a second step in salvation and in actual fact it is not it is not whenever we believe where there is belief true belief whenever you really believe you will surrender nobody can believe that there is a god nobody can believe that god gave his son without giving your life to him if you believe you will surrender when somebody says believe then surrender then belief is not true you don't really believe you might have a head Head acknowledgement. You might see the facts. You might even join a church, but you don't believe. True belief always comes along with surrender. Because I believe, I surrender. Like Jayla says, What must I do to be saved? He was ready to do anything. Like Paul says, Lord, what will you have me to do? He believed, and so he was ready to do anything. He surrendered in that moment. That's what true belief is it takes surrender along with it but i've put surrender as a second thing which which as i'm saying is not a second thing it's a part of the same thing then jesus said unto his disciples if any man will come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me jesus mentioned surrender deny himself take up his cross for whosoever shall save his life shall lose it but whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Whoever surrenders completely will find life. But the next verse ties both things together. Knowing this, Romans 6 and verse 6, that our old man is crucified with him. When you believe in Jesus Christ, you receive Christ. Your old man is put to death. When you become united with Jesus through faith, self dies self is put away and so you are surrendered if you don't surrender when you come to christ you don't really believe what we need brothers and sisters is genuine belief genuine faith because faith means trust and trust always surrenders i always emphasize that when i became a christian one of the verses that brought me this is the great verse that made me give my life to christ it says in all your ways acknowledge him give him everything in your life and he will direct your path 
If you give him everything in your life, David, he will take charge and everything is going to work out perfectly from this day forward if you will do it. When I believed, I surrendered. That was the beginning of my life. And praise God, the one who started me on the journey has kept me all these years. Our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that from now on we should not serve sin. So surrender, we say faith and surrender, but I'm saying they are the same thing. They, they go hand in hand. And the third thing is that we are to abide. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus, I don't have that verse on the screen, but I, Jesus says, abide in me and I in you. And he makes us know that the one who abides in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. If we stay with Jesus, we believe in Jesus, we join our lives to Jesus by faith, which brings surrender. And then we continue to walk in that way. Let me bring up this verse. I don't have it on the screen, but it just came to my mind. Let me see. Colossians 2 and verse 6, is it? As you have therefore received Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. What Paul is saying here is that the same way you came to Jesus, the same way you continue to walk. How did you come to Jesus? You came by faith. And the faith you had in Jesus brought surrender. And the same process of faith and surrender, you walk in the same way. Don't turn to anything else. Don't leave faith and go to works. Don't leave abiding in Christ and go to abiding in your own energy and effort. Stay with Christ. And anytime you find yourself drifting, Go back to Jesus Christ because that is where the answer lies. It's nowhere else. Jesus says, abide in me. And so we are told in 1 John 3 and verse 6 that whosoever, abide, whosoever abideth in, in him sinneth not. Those who continue to sin, those who continue to walk in the way of sin, they have not seen him and they have not known him. So, by the grace of God, this is what I wanted to share today. This brings us to the end of the thoughts I have to share this morning. Now, I have to admit that as I was going through this, it was a blessing to me because I saw that there were, there were ideas that I had in my mind, ways that I looked at this, these verses, that I was looking at them the wrong way. These verses presented difficulties for me because I never took the time to look at them closely. You know what was beautiful for me to see that if you take each of these passages and go through them piece by piece, point by point, you find that they are in perfect harmony with the rest of Scripture. It's beautiful for me to see that the Bible harmonizes even when it seems like there are ir irreconcilable differences. Our God has not given us something that is to confuse us it just takes a little time to examine and so i'm very blessed by seeing with greater clarity what these passages mean and i hope it will be a blessing for the rest of us a uh, great message and you know there's nothing that can um be gainsay against what what you presented however what came to me you know the entering is hard and the and the pattern the journey is easy concept so i'm wondering it seems in my life my experience that that the entering was the easy part and the struggling with self and dying to self on the journey is the difficult part now for me i'm not sure if that makes sense i i understand brother brother ken there, there are two things to consider, I would say. First of all is, usually at the beginning of the journey, there is a surge of strong faith. The, the, the challenge we have is to maintain that faith along the journey because we, 
we often have, we, we, we humans are like this. You feel like, okay, I'm here now. I can relax. I don't need to. It's like when you get married, okay? At the beginning of the journey, everything is about your wife. But as time passes, you fall into a pattern of habit and taking each other for granted. And so that initial love is not as strong as it used to be. I, I think that could, could be, we could compare we could compare the experience of Christianity with that. So maybe that is one reason why it becomes more difficult sometimes because our focus on Christ is not as strong. The second thing is, what we are looking at this morning is primarily the, the, the question of salvation. How to be saved. I know the word salvation. I know it's, it's, a, it's a tricky word, especially for Brother Joel. So I have to be careful how I use it. Although I think I've already, I've already touched on, on a sore spot. But anyway, here's the point. The, the, the beginning of the journey takes us into salvation. When we are in, we are in. The journey does not, is not what saves us. It's the choosing of Christ that constitutes being saved. Now, to, to lose that place of being saved is not easy. That's what I keep insisting. So even if our walk is not that perfect, we don't lose that place. We might lose, we might lose our closeness to the Lord. We disappoint the Lord. We let down the kingdom, things that we absolutely don't want to do. But we don't jeopardize our salvation so easily. Now, I'm not saying we cannot be lost. I'm saying it is not a simple matter. So getting through the gate is the first and the greatest step. The process is the work of a lifetime. The process of walking in what we have is the work of a lifetime. And sometimes, as you say, along that road, we often may get weak, but the problem is that do we now begin to fear and to tremble and to feel that we are lost because we are not able to walk that road perfectly? I'm saying that is not assurance, that is not rest. And God has given us rest and assurance. And our rest and assurance are not based upon our performance, but upon the fact that we are in the hands of Jesus Christ. Yeah, so what I was thinking, I agree, but what I was thinking is that uh, as we come into a knowledge of Christ and of, of the plan or the self plan of salvation, the love of God, everything that we're learning. It shines a light more in the darkness in our in our hearts. When we first come in, you know, we don't necessarily realize how re reprobate we are, how sinful we are. And as we get closer to Christ, I think there was a statement by Sister White to that effect that basically, you know, the closer we come to Christ, the more we realize our unworthiness. And maybe it's that unworthiness, that feeling of uh, realizing that we are fallen, sinful creatures. And, you know, our actions are what put Christ on the cross. Uh, it's those realizations that maybe cause us to to doubt and stumble on our journey, if that makes sense. I guess that's a part of it, too, Brother Ken. Um, yeah, there's some other, there are some other elements that I would comment on in that as well. But I'm going to leave it because there are others who um, also want to comment. But I, I agree. I agree. Uh, Brother Joel and then Sister Talia. All right. Um, can you hear me, David? I'm hearing you, Brother Joe. All right. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I'm going to ask you to give me the liberty of just making a statement before I ask the question. Is that okay? Sure. All right. I've come to believe that the problem for Christianity is that, as it says in your Revelation seminar, that there's a victory that has been won by Christ. Um, and Satan's strategy has been first to try and destroy the church by force and then um, his second strategy is through doctrine to destroy the church if he can have us not understand the truth and i believe he has been very successful in doing this he can prevent what the purpose of the gospel is to accomplish the bible says the gospel is the power of god unto salvation for those that believe it so if we have doctrine correctly formulated, then the power of the truth of what God has accomplished in Christ 
goes a far way in accomplishing God's purposes for us. The Bible says we shall know the truth, the truth shall set us free. I think what we have been seeing over the years after this strategy by Satan is a slow movement of God in revealing uh, and replacing uh, and repairing, I should say, the breach of false doctrine. And I think that the most powerful of these doctrines are those that run so deep within the hearts and the minds of Christian men that showing them verses in the scripture is never enough. An example is this issue of the Trinity doctrine. There's so much scripture to show that the Trinity doctrine is an incorrect and illogical position to have, yet the great majority of Christianity hold on to it. And I find that the more powerful of Satan's deceptions in terms of doctrinal um, impurities are like this. When Augustine first presents this doctrine of original sin that says it's impossible for man to become holy in this body, it is something that is really deeply believed, especially like by a man like Calvin who has had such a great effect upon Christian thought and his ideas that it's God's sovereignty and not man's will or a combination of both that determines uh, what happens to man. I find that for the most part in our group, God has helped us a lot where most of these doctrines that have this kind of strength over the mind, for most of us here, we have been freed from it. The idea of an eternal burning hell, you know, the idea of God in character as being somebody who is vengeful, just waiting on an opportunity to punish. As I said before, the doctrine of original sin, the Trinity doctrine. But the doctrine that I find that is probably doing the greatest damage and still continues to do it today is where we are on this issue of what salvation is. I think it is even a greater um, work that Satan has done in preventing us to understanding the purposes of God as it pertains to this. Now, your presentation today for me kind of pushes into it a little bit because you're presented verses that seem to suggest that salvation is something that has some difficulty and you show us other verses that show that being saved is something that is not hard at all. It is something that is accomplished through a gift of God that man just has to receive. Where then is the disconnection? I find that the disconnection is what we do with the Greek word saved and the word salvation. There is one word in the Greek for save and there's a different word for salvation. And what I find is that has happened is that for most of us, Wherever we see the word save, we've been using it as the word salvation, and therein is where the problem lies. Now, I find so far, and I'm almost done, that there are four works of Christ within the plan of salvation. Three of them are events. Justification of blood, something that Christ did and did alone in his death on behalf of men, which is for the whole world. Justification of faith, which is an event, something that God gives us as gift for those who surrender, to the movement of the Holy Spirit and heart, and the glorification of man, the receiving of the perfect body for the righteous in the twinkling of an eye when Jesus Christ returns. All works of Christ, all our salvific words, all our works that push it against what sin has done to man. But there is one work that involves difficulty that we are not recognizing, and it is sanctification, the transformation of the mind and the giving over of our will Brother Ken mentioned it a while ago. It is a work of God that takes time. Unlike the others, it's not process, David. It's not an event, it is process. And these are the verses that indicate difficulty. When Paul speaks about striving to the high mark that is in Jesus Christ, or when the Bible talks about us being heres with Christ and co heres with him if we suffer with him, when it speaks about Jesus being made perfect through the things that is suffer, as a result of that, he has become also, you know, the, 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 you know, he takes us through a place where he is the author and finisher of our faith. The beginning of this work of Christ is something that is easy for us to enter into a relationship with Christ. But the transforming power of Christ in us takes some amount of effort and struggling overcoming what is also still taking place within our flesh. And David, as long as we don't recognize that 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 um, that Ma Martin Luther 
was not correct in his, in, in, in his statement on what salvation is. He was absolutely right about justification being by faith and faith alone. But his statement on salvation is not correct. Salvation is not by faith alone. Jesus made that point clear that he gives us a gift and that gift is to produce something by abiding in him. And that happens through obedience of the Holy Spirit and the giving up of our will. There is where the difficulty comes in overcoming what's in our flesh to give ourselves over to the Spirit. And for me, David, as long as we continue to not recognize this, we have a problem in seeing salvation correctly. I know I said I was going to ask a question, but I'll stop there. All right, Brother Joel, um, you and I have had discussions, and I've, I've tried to say to you that many times I am challenged with the... the with the the words that are used because definitions can mean the way a person defines a word is, is important and you you just you just corroborated that by saying that the word saved and salvation is from two different greek words now i i will say something i, I let, let me respond very quickly by saying that if i eliminate saved and salvation for me it doesn't matter Okay, it, it, it probably it, it seems it matters a lot to you, but for me, I, I'll tell you why it doesn't matter. Because what I'm talking about is the is the experience of getting to a place where I am secure with God. Whether I use the word saved or salvation, that is my definition. So if 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 using those words becomes a problem, I can use another word. I can find another phrase to use. But in in my presentation this morning, what I'm talking about is being secure. In my place in Christ. Now, if you if you understood me or uh, to be saying that we don't go through a process where we develop in Christ and where we live a holy life, I think you probably badly misunderstood me because in everything I've said, year in year out, I've spoken about the necessity of a witness for the kingdom, the necessity of growing up into Christ and be per being perfected. So there's no question of living a holy life. That was not the issue. And I think if you, if, you, if you heard me saying this, you have badly misunderstood what I'm saying. I'm talking about the process by which we come to Christ and obtain that security in Christ that we know we have made it into the kingdom. Whether we call it saved or salvation, I will eliminate those words. And, and on that basis, I think that everything I said this morning is biblically correct. The way, the way to... To obtain that security in Christ is not by our work, never, absolutely. And I don't know about Martin Luther and Calvin, but I'm telling you, whatever their definitions, my understanding is coming from the Bible. I, I have never studied Luther and I've never studied Calvin. I've heard people talk about Calvinism. I have a superficial understanding that he believed in predestination. I don't study those things. Everything that I, 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 I share is what I see in the Bible. So that's the way I, I, I that's Amen. the only response I can make to what you say, Brother Joy. So I, I'll just do this, and I don't want to be argumentative, David, but I'll just use two examples of what you said. You spoke about what Peter said, about the righteous scarcely being saved. Paul says in, in, in Romans 6, verse 19, that we're going from righteousness to holiness. He acknowledges the final place that God wills us to be. It's not in a place where we're righteous, but when we're, where we're holy. Now, what is the difference between those two positions? Why Peter say that the righteous are scarcely saved? Righteousness is a state that we come into as a gift of God by believing God. Holiness <laughs> happens, David, by obedience to the Holy Spirit. It's not those who say, Lord, Lord, but those that do it, the will of my Father in heaven, that enters the kingdom of God. Now, do I you, could point you, out an example of what you said earlier as well. Do you believe witness. Do you believe that the person who abides in Christ is obedient to Christ? If a person is abiding, then he's walking in the Spirit. So yes, he's then abiding. So where's the problem? The problem is when I think we sacrifice an understanding of the difficulty of the road of transforming sanctification and identify it as being something that is easy. I don't think that that is easy. Overcoming what in our flesh is not easy. And to say it's easy, I think creates a problem for those of us who find difficulty in our walk sure. in trying to do what we would want to do and having a difficulty for it, wondering if something is wrong with our experience in Christ. No, it's the not thing is, easy transformation, David. 
then then we're, you're contradicting Jesus because Jesus says my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Yes, when you're abiding in Christ. Of course. Abiding in Christ. But David, my point is that abiding in Christ, there's a challenge because the flesh and the spirit are at war for what will dominate in a man who, when he receives Christ, is not fully transformed. I am saying, I am saying the problem, I am saying the problem is a person not walking in faith. He allows his faith to grow weak. That's a, that's a fundamental problem. Everything stems from that. That's what I am saying. Everything stems from lack of faith. If, if, if lack of faith is not the problem, what are you going to do? Produce works without faith? I, I, I don't disagree with you at all. I don't think the fact that you're saying that though means that what I'm saying is not also true. I worry about this idea because, you know, what I said really, you know, this one save, always save idea, you know, is something that runs very deep, you know, to the point where if as a Christian you speak about obedience, it's almost like you're not supposed to say it that way. You know, and obedience is a requirement for salvation. The Bible is clear on that. It is a requirement for salvation. And that is not easy, David. That's my point. So I agree with you that it's by faith. I agree it's only through Christ and by Christ. But to say that it is easy, that salvation is easy, being saved to justification is easy. Being transformed to sanctification is not easy. The Bible speaks about it being a trial of fire and every man's work being tested of what type it is. Over and over we find these words in the Bible, David, that speaks of the difficulty of transformation. So that's what I'm pushing back against. Whether it's hard or it's easy, it's the work of Christ in you. I am saying that to divert your attention to Christ, from Christ and to begin to focus on your own works is a bad mistake. That's my I point. I agree with that. David. All right, then, Joel, Brother Joel, I think we're saying the same thing, maybe in different ways. What I am, I am concerned about is I have been on a road, and I think many of us have been on a road where I, I have been on a road where I, I worked very hard trying to climb, a, 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 as, I, as I put it, a glass mountain covered with oil. I tried. And it was, I did not find it enjoyable. I didn't find it pleasant. I did not find it bringing me closer to the Lord. Now that I have a more restful state of mind, my life is not worse. My journey is better. My assurance is better. I, I am looking at the practical effects of my change of state of mind. Understood. And, and that is one reason why I'm so so fixated on saying things the way I say them because I have practical experience. The thing is, I would ask you a question, but it is unfair. You know, I would ask you, how has it changed your 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 holy living practically having this emphasis? But I won't ask. I just ask you to consider it and everybody to consider because if I ask it would be unfair. Anyway. No, I'd answer, it, I'd answer it honestly, David, by saying that there are struggles that I'm still having based on my recognition of what it is that God is seeking from me. He's not see and I agree with you completely, David, in terms of how we should look at it and the way in which and you way preach it. I, I agree with it completely. I don't think there's another way to preach it other than the way in which you have been preaching. All I'm pushing back against is the idea that we have salvation and justification. That is what troubles me, David. That's all. All right. Uh, I'd love to find another way to express what I'm saying. I'm not using the word salvation. So, all right, Brother Joe. Um, I saw there were some hands that, were, that went down, but it's Brother Judah and Brother Ray, based on the hands I see still. Up. No, no, no. It was Sister Dor uh, Sister Talia first. Okay. Except you took down your hands, Sister Talia. That's what happened. But anyway, all Sorry. right. You go ahead. It's because it, this, this, this platform keeps bouncing me out. And, and, you know, we all need to be praying for each other with regards to, you know, our equipment's working. Because I see noticing that a lot of equipments are not working. Nevertheless, that wasn't my point. Um, thank you, Brother David. I do appreciate the... Can you hear me, by the way? Yes, absolutely. I'm hearing you. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. I do appreciate the message today. And I thank the Lord always for a message that is encouraging and, and, and very easy to understand. Um, now, there was a scripture, Luke 4, I'm sorry, Luke 20, 
Luke, Luke 14, 26, where it says, if any man come to me and hate not his father. And, and I'll stop there because I, I, I couldn't quite grapple that simply because why is it hate? And then I looked in the concordance to kind of get an idea to understand, you know, its reference, but it, I'm still not getting why hate, you know, as opposed to, um, because we're taught to love. And so that, that, that's very confusing. And maybe that's not the word I need for myself, but, you know, it just contradicts the fact that we're to love, even if, you know, so I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that, if you don't mind. Sure, Sister Talia. Jesus, Jesus always said things in an extreme way so that he, he wanted to make sure people, the, 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 the things stuck in people's mind. For example, when Jesus says, let the dead bury their dead, you understand that right away because you know a dead person cannot bury somebody. So you understand that he's speaking, he's exaggerating what he's saying. He's using, I don't know the, 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 the term for it, the type of speech, but he doesn't mean the dead will bury the dead, but he means that people who are spiritually dead concern themselves about lesser matters. When, when, so, so he's always saying things in an extreme way because he wants to get the point. So when he says hate mother and father, when you hate something, how do you, how do you act towards it? You, you, you take it from the place of it doesn't hold a pr prominent place in your life. He's really saying we need to be willing to give up everything that relates to my life and accept everything that is God's will for me. Now, what are the things that we love? Mother, father, sister, brother, houses, lands. These are the things that make up our life. So Jesus is saying we need to give up our life and accept Christ's life instead of ours. But instead of saying it in that simple way, he, he puts it in a complicated way by saying, hate mother, father, sister, brother, houses, lands, because he's really saying your life. So he, he picks out the things that constitute our life and he mentions them. And he's saying, you have, to, you have to reject your life. That's what he's really saying. But he uses the word hate because the word hate is doing what it makes you do right now. It's making us stop and think about what he's saying and try to find out what is his true meaning. So it will stick in your mind forever. You'll never forget it. Whereas if he had simply said, you must surrender. You wouldn't remember. Yeah. Crystal. Okay, Sister Talia. Um, it's Brother Judah then. Right, Brother Judah. I'll defer, Brother, Brother David. Thank you. Okay, okay. Go ahead, Brother Ray. Yeah, Brother David, thank you so much for uh, this presentation. I've learned a lot, and not only have I learned a lot, but uh, my faith is fortified even more understanding. I don't know, some people have struggles understanding you, but I don't because I believe we are sanctified uh, when we are born again. I'm, I'm reading at 1 John 3, 9. It says, whosoever is born of God, do not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him and cannot be sinned because he is born of God. So if you are born again and you are born of God, you don't commit sin, you don't do sin, then you are sanctified. Now, it also means that because of this, you're going to have a long life on whatever time you're going to live on earth. You may go through troubles, uh, you know, and stuff like that, and you may commit something wrong, you may do something wrong. But you're not doing it willingly. That's why we have Christ, our righteousness. But I believe that when you are born again, you are sanctified, set aside because of what it says in First John uh, 3, 9, chapter 3, verse 9. Am I correct? Yes. Yes. Absolutely, Thank you. Brother Ray. Thank you. So I understood that. Thank you. 